Hey, hey, welcome everyone to Stan Kind's talk series. We have Candy Olant, Kristen Chapman, and a very special guest today, Derek Furlow Jr. Derek is a former rock star at the University of Tennessee Safety. He's an author, an inspirational speaker, a mental health advocate. The list goes on and on. And we just feel so privileged and happy and honored for you to be here with us, Derek, and bringing your wealth of experience. I appreciate that kind and, 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 and grateful introduction. Definitely thankful for those words and glad to be here with you ladies today. So today we're going to be talking about transitions uh, from high school to college students and how they can stay mentally fixed. We know you have a ton of experience with that. Um, so can you give us just a little bit of your backstory for our listeners who may not know who you are? Yes. Um, so Derek Furlow Jr., born and raised in Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, um, and in the city where I was from initially, um, it was poverty underserved community. Um, mom was raising three kids by herself. So she did what she needed to do for us to survive, which um, many nights was was us figuring out what we were going to eat while she was at work. And, and then a lot of the times it was just trying to make ends meet. And I realized ends don't necessarily meet. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the struggle as, as a youth made me hungry for more and made me want something more out of life. And I seen my mom doing the best she could with what she was at, with what she had. And often she would just move us to different um, locations in, in essence, striving to put us in a better environment and finally moved out of the inner city of Atlanta um, where we had a little bit less drugs, less violence, and was able to move down to Griffin where things weren't necessarily um, better, but they did move in a positive direction until we was able to meet um, her husband today, um, Mr. Leonard. And things kind of got a little bit better from there because now she had help. Um, she wasn't doing it on her own. She had three kids. He had three kids. We were kind of like the um, the modern day Brady Bunch. Brady Bunch, yeah. <laughs> My sister's name was Misha, not Marsha. Um, <laughs> so when we got there, that was the first time. Man, we were more in a more financially stable situation. And that was the first time I had the chance to play organized sports. And I seen um, football as a vehicle that could help me take control of my life. I'd also changed my family's life. And that was the, the goals to some degree at that point. But then my stepdad got another promotion and raise and that um, promotion moved us from Griffin, Georgia at the time to across at Arkansas. Mm. And at that point life got really real because I was going into my mm. sophomore year of high school and I just went from um, Georgia to the middle of nowhere, Arkansas and life got real. So um, it was a culture shock. And at that point I realized I could only do what I could do to control the control to control my destiny. So I decided to take sports seriously and um, look, looked at football as a vehicle that can get me out of Arkansas. So I came over to get out of Arkansas plan to get me a full ride scholarship, honestly, back to Georgia. Um, literally, did I know I ended up going to Tennessee. It was some different plans in the midst of all the, 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 the life that happened while we were there. But um, that's what got me to the University of Tennessee. And that's what the, the, the grind took it to another level of, okay, I made it this far. How do I go ahead and, and get to the NFL so I can change my family's mm -hmm. life? And of mm -hmm. course that journey didn't go how I expected to go as well. But when it came down to it, I was aware along the way and seeing some open doors and seeing guys that came before me um, that struggled. So I said, all right, let me learn from their struggles versus have to learn from my own. And at that point I, I realized that if this league thing didn't work out, I need to figure out how to take some things from sports and figure out how they correlate to my life or where I wanted to be in business and figure out how I can carry them over and correlate them and apply them. And that's what I was able to do when I came out and hurt my shoulder, the NFL dream um, crash burn. And I was able to take some of those principles that I learned from sports with all the years of playing them and correlate them into sales and entrepreneurship. And once I finally had a little success, I seen, see, I, I tried it out on a couple other um athletes and they had some of that same success. So I seen it was duplicatable. And at mm. that point I felt like God truly gave me my purpose was to impact and inspire and empower um, athletes to take those intangible transferable skills um, from the game and apply them mm. in a different area of life and help them transition like a champion. So that's when the first book was wrote, what's next, how to transition like a champion, I ended up creating the curriculum as well, the transition playbook. And from that point, moving forward, we've just been on this mission to help people transition like a champion uh, from who they are to who they want to become, from where they are to where they want to go. And um, I concluded that 
I was doing it for athletes and my peers, but the transition didn't stop there. Tra- people transition every day. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a firm believer you the in transition just came out of a transition or transition is on its way. And it looks a lot of, it looks a lot of different ways, a lot of different variables. And we've just been on that mission and, and then the, through the grace of God, the opportunity spilled over to um, mental health and how we can help people transition from where they are to where they want to go. Mm-hmm. So it's been an overall journey um, to not say too much. It's, it's, um, it's been a, it's been a process. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be here and, and to be able to make an impact and make a difference where we at. You know, Derek, you make, God, you brought, there are so many things that just went through my head when you were talking about your, your backstory. First of all, props to all the single parents out there. Mm -hmm. Um, your mama obviously did a phenomenal job, um, instilling resiliency in you with all of the transitions that she had to initiate to get you, her family into a position, um, to where more opportunities could be realized perhaps. So early on, your mama was modeling for you how to transition, how to be resilient, how to have grit, and all of those things directly transition into your adult, your adolescent, teenage and adult life with being able to say, okay, I'm going to UT, I'm doing this, I'm realizing this path. Oh, that path was jerked away from me. I got to dig down deep. I got to get gritty. I got to figure out what the next chapter look, looks like. So That's much, it. so much there. Yeah. You, you, can you, you, you picked that up really quick because it was this never settle, never quit attitude, this relentless pursuit of continual improvement. And I saw it day in and day out. So quite frankly, um, that was the model. That was, that was the expectation. So when things didn't go my way, uh, I didn't know anything else. So that was the blessing in the skies. In the midst of the, the, the troubles and the adversity, I say in the middle of your mess, don't miss your message. I was in a lot of messes along my life. And I was fortunate enough. I caught, I was able to pick up on those messages um, along the way. So that, that was that was a blessing in the skies. I've got to ask how you ended up at the University of Tennessee, because I went there. I did my master's degree there in education and go balls. And I just I got to know how you ended up there. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Well, well, go balls back. And um, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so I get to Arkansas and I come up with my first plan I ever had in my life, which is called a get out of Arkansas plan. And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, OK, how do I get out of here playing sports? And at that point in time, I got there. It was, it was basketball season. I was going to play basketball. We had we came home during Christmas break, which my home was in Atlanta. So we leave and we come back and I miss practice. Um, before the season was going to get ready to get started. And coach was like, hey, you got to run 500 bleachers to get back on the team. And I'm like, bro, I don't like basketball that much. So that went basketball, never played it again. Um, so at that point, they left football, baseball, and track. I don't like trust people throwing a ball by my face because you're supposed to zig when you zag, you get hit. So baseball was out. Track was like, don't mess team. with my mug. <laughs> right. So by default, it was just football left. So I said, okay, well, what I need to do to get a full ride scholarship back to Georgia. At that point in time, a guy by the name of Darren McFadden had committed as a sophomore to the University of Arkansas. So I went and looked at his stats. And I said, I'm going to mirror this. I'm going to rush for 2,200 yards, 20 touchdowns, take the school to the first state championship. And by default, we'll get enough attention, and I'll get me a full ride scholarship back to Georgia. So I went to work sophomore year. That plan don't necessarily go how I expected it to go. So we read back up junior year. All of a sudden, we go 1-0, 2-0, 3-0, 4-0, 5-0. 5-0, first time in school history, start. Look up, 6-0, 7-0, 8-0, 9-0, 10-0. First undefeated season in school history. We got three games left for the state championship, and this thing is rolling. And all those, the attention is starting to happen. So first game of the playoffs, tight game, we win. Second game of the playoffs, not even close. Third game, the guys were pretty smart. They let the grass grow. They wet the field because our advantage was our speed. And we could not run for nothing. It was wet and it was cold. And all we did was fall every time we tried to run. Mm -hmm. The game was 7-0 until about the third quarter. They scored again, 14-0. We scored 14-7. They end up scoring 21-7. We lose that game. Get out of Arkansas playing, crash, burn. So I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. But little did I know. I started getting attention. I started getting these letters in the mail, started getting mm-hmm. calls for, for camps and visits and unofficial visits. So it was starting to work. So I'm like, okay, cool. I got one more year. We can do this thing again. Let's, let's do this thing again, bigger and better. And, and I knew at this point, I had this confidence that, oh, it's, it's, it's going to happen. So in that process of visiting, I think I went to five different 
camps, visited seven different schools, been to the University of Georgia three times. Um, but one school invited me up. They wanted the top guys in the state to come, and I was never going to go there, but I went to this, I went anyway, and it was the University of Arkansas. And um, leaving that camp, we're finishing up. We do these ball drills, and as I jump, I come down kind of funny, don't think much of it. Um, but on that ride home, my knee swells up. So oh, no. I'm like, crap, my knee swelled up. So um, I kind of panicked a little bit, but I, I kept – my composure, we end up going to the doctor. They said, you tore your meniscus. All right, no biggie. Mm-hmm. So they're like, okay. Coach says, you get the surgery, they put you out three um, three weeks. You'll come back when conference play starts. So that was my plan. I missed those first three game, games we can win without me. Come back, and we'll finish this, get out of Arkansas playing, and, and win the state championship. Um, well, I end up going to the hospital, end up having the surgery, and as I'm getting rolled out of the operating room, I woke up. And I felt this breath, this brace on my left leg and the doctors to my right. I'm still a little sedated. And as I touched that brace, I remember looking to my right and I was like, hey, doc, what's this brace for? And at that point, um, he said some words that have changed the trajectory of my life for the rest of my life. Was he said that brace is for your ACL. I went in supposed to have a meniscus surgery, came out with ACL surgery. Oh, man. So I went in and came out with a surgery I wasn't even planning on having. Oh, my gosh. Devastated. Furious. Um, and that's how that journey went. And sure enough, as wow. week three and week four came and week five came, I wasn't coming back. And as the word got out, the team was already 3-0. and I think we went 4-0. and We ended up losing five games straight. All those letters and offers and interest that I had received from all those schools, all of them went away. And this is the crazy part about it. Out of all those interest letters and offers and visits that I went on, I never visited Tennessee. So at Ooh. this point, I'm mad, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, because everything I had worked so hard for was completely ripped away from me without me planning on it. That, that, I, it was un- uncontrollable. Mm-hmm. So at this point, if, at that point in time, if I would have knew what depressed was, I probably was that. If I would have knew what... Um, what, 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 what mental health issues were. So there was words mm-hmm. for it. I probably had those, um, mm-hmm. but I, I couldn't make an excuse. So all I could do was figure out what could I do next? Cause I was going to get out of Arkansas. So, but Derek, during that time, did you have to, even though you couldn't put words to it, looking back on it, were you going through the, the grief of the loss of what you thought you were going to do at that time? I cried yeah. every day. It was, it was, it was, it was, I, that was my first time I spent a year not being an athlete. Oh, I, I, wow. I, I, that was my first death. My identity as an athlete died. Mm. So I, I grieve every single day because I'm rehabbing. Why me, Lord? Why me? This is oh, this right. is the question I ask myself. Mad, frustrated. But what I did do, I knew how to work. So what I did do, I rehab three times a day, which ended up pushing me. Because I said, okay, maybe I can get back before the season ends. So I pushed the workout, which pain tolerance was really high. I ended up getting a knee infection mm. um, and didn't think much of it. Um, the staples came out, still didn't think much of it because it didn't necessarily hurt my drive to get a better life and to get out of Arkansas playing overpowered the, the the idea of my knees infected to the point that I'm like, OK, cool. Well, you know what? I don't really like track that much. I'm going to run track. So I was I was I was committed to getting out of Arkansas. And in that process of rehab, I remember on the bed one day I, I was asking why me and I heard this voice say to me. I said, why me, Lord? Why me? And I, I, I was phrased this. I said, be careful what you ask for because you never know what answer you may get. And I mm-hmm. re- remember hearing some say to me, I gave you that football stage for the glorification of my kingdom. And you used it for your own selfish purpose, ambitions and goals. So I had to take it away from you, get your attention. And I remember that particular moment. I didn't know what I would do if I ever got another stage again. But I knew I wouldn't use it for my own selfish personal ambitions and goals. So I decided I'm going to run track because I'm getting out of Arkansas. And sure enough, as I'm running track, doing track season. Um, that's what called spring ball. And ironically enough, I'm running track. I get this letter in the mail from the University of Tennessee inviting me to come up to the spring fling to meet the coaches and the team. Never visited, watched them play once. It was when they were playing against Georgia, I was rooting for Georgia. <laughs> and um, sure enough, I showed it to my mom. She said, you going? I'm like, yep. So we come up. I had a chance to meet the players, meet the coaches. And I got here and it was this weird feeling. It felt like home. And when I walked into the meeting room to meet mm-hmm. Coach Caldwell, Coach Slade, and Coach Former, I walk in. In my head, I had a million different questions. For one, how do they know of me? Um, and, and, and all these things. And literally, as we got in there, they, the first thing that came out, I said, well, how did y'all find me? They said, well, you were actually on the film against two other guys that are coming here. And we heard about your injury. And 
unfortunately, we don't have a scholarship for you right now, but we know if you recover and you get back to the athlete you're capable of being, we got a full ride scholarship waiting on you. That's all I need to hear. I wow. said, sign me up. Wow. And literally, that's how that story went. Three months later, I was at the University of Tennessee. As soon as I graduated, I left a week late, a week later. Nine months after after surgery, on campus, in roll, ready to rock and roll. Chip on my shoulder, back against the wall, got to make it happen. Wow. So, I Christian, have I know you asked that in. question. That's how I got to the University of Tennessee. Not not by choice, um, by the grace of God. <laughs> that is insane. That's that's an insane story. I never expected that to be the answer. <laughs> That's a journey, Derek. I know. Oh, I yeah. Mean, seriously, of like self, um, self-awareness, self mm-hmm. right? Um, so many lessons in life for young people when they when they hear your, your story. You, you wanted so badly for something to happen, but you didn't go down the original path that you thought you had laid for yourself. It was right? the biggest blessing in disguise. Because mm-hmm. if I would have came in without adversity, Without that death as an athlete, I wouldn't know who I was outside of an athlete for one later on in life because it's going to hit you at some point in time. It just happened to hit me early. Um, mm-hmm. But for two, it removed me from Georgia, which my cousin and my best friend go to prison a year after we gone. Really? I could have been with one of them. So it was one of those things. I look back, it was one of the biggest blessings in disguise on so many levels. And then the, 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 the appreciation for the game, the appreciation for the opportunity wouldn't have been had if I would have came in and everything went smooth. If I would have got the scholarship right out of high school, if because the ego was already there, and it, mm-hmm. you get to this platform, this stage, and all these people love and praise you, you you kind of get a little um, delusional, or, mm-hmm. or, or you, you kind of get a little a, a ahead of yourself. So, all those things was probably the the best worst things that could have happened to me, and I'm grateful for them. And and it just happened to, to to get me to a place earlier than a lot of my teammates because I had had a chance to to go through that death as an athlete in that transition on, on one particular part. But a lot of them came from a lot of different background issues. We just, all of them look different. So I'm grateful for the journey. We're changing for nothing. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes transitions are a gift. Yeah, they are. Candy and I just made a big life transition. We both left education and we started this journey together and um, never really, I mean, I never really saw myself leaving education but now that I'm doing this, I, I can't imagine doing anything else. Like this just makes sense to me. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the cool thing about it, education equipped you with some things that you're able to take from education and apply to this to add more value. You, got, you had an unfair advantage. Yeah, hundred percent. I also I couldn't do this job if I hadn't have been a teacher. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's a blessing. It really is. And sometimes you don't know that you need a transition. And then it kind of just happens, you know, and, and then you have to like be open to it, to realize it, follow it, not follow it, evaluate it, see if it's worth it. And you had to do all those things and look where you are now. I mean, it's not a Cinderella story necessarily because you had a lot, a whole lot of like adversity along the way and, and ups and downs and all those kinds of things. Um Sorry, I kind of got us off track a little bit with that, but I'm just thinking about your journey is just so inspiring for for parents and kids that are going to be listening to this or teenagers who are listening to this to see that, you know, you might have this and sometimes it's parents pushing kids down a particular path, you know, or encouraging them or they want them to follow in their own footsteps. Um, But that's not really what the kid needs, you know, Um, and just realizing that sometimes life's going to lead you in a different direction. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to step up and you're going to swing at it? Are you going to step up? You're going to embrace it. You're going to, you're going to step back and say, no, I can't. You know, why me? Well, why not me? Come on. Right? Come on. Why not me? Come on, bring it. Let's, let's do this. You know? That's the question you got to ask. Why, why not? I asked why me for a period of time when I was laying in that bed doing rehab three times a day. Why me? And then mm-hmm. I, I concluded it was me because... What if it was somebody else that didn't have the, the 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 resiliency? What if it was somebody else that hadn't been through adversity? What if it was somebody else that didn't have this relentless pursuit uh, or a bigger why? What if it mm-hmm. was somebody else? Like who knows what the outcome would have been in, in in the journey of me being able to impact, inspire, and empower people would have been taken away. So it's 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 the the blessing in disguise. But one thing I've learned along the way, um, 
first you have opportunity, then you have difficulty. And then after difficulty, you have opportunity. It's a never ending cycle. Mm -hmm. So you just got to understand that when you're in the, in the midst of difficulty, it's going to create an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then when you got a great opportunity, it's probably going to create some difficulty. And the cycle never ends. Change is constant. You just got to be aware of that and just understand that where you are right now is preparing you for where you're going through. So yeah. um, in the middle of your mess, don't miss your message. message. Along the way, you're going to go through a lot of different messages. What, what are the mess teaching you? And if mm -hmm. you can take away, take away and cipher those messages out of the mess, once you get to that next phase, you're going to be more equipped, more prepared to handle it. Because mm -hmm. life doesn't get easier. You just learn to handle hard better. Like that's, that's the name of this game. Life is not going to get easier. You just learn to handle hard better. And I was fortunate enough. I learned to handle hard better at a real early stage of life and grew up uncomfortable. So I was very comfortable being uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I, I, I don't mind risking. I don't mind the transition. I don't mind the change because most of life change in my life was changing for trying to change for the better. And that's just a proper perspective that it doesn't, it doesn't scare me per se, because I understand you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And after, di after difficulty leads opportunity, and after opportunity leads difficulty. So I'm expecting it. However, I can set the standard and the tempo and expect the best out of every situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've been through a lot okay. of really tough transitions. How do you yeah. keep so positive and keep yourself motivated and care for your mental health through all that? Well, well, earlier, Christian, it was kind of funny. Um, like it's it's so cool to finally have a term for it, mental health, because I, I didn't know what it was. But I believe um, I was doing self care in a way that I didn't even know that was a phrase for it. And then from the positivity, I look back at it. I, I got to say an odds, O D D S, and the odds were always against me. But what I concluded in this journey was. Others don't determine your success. You do. Mm. So those are the odds. The odds are in my favor. Others don't determine success. You do. So it's just what you make of it. And the cool thing about it is, as I look back at every single issue or adversity or challenge, I made it out. So it, it just it just fortified my faith to keep going. And just the track record is so good. The Lord been so good to me. The track record is so strong. It's like, man, you was down and out. You made it out. You was down and out. You made it. I, you just keep on. I'm looking back at all these small wins. It's like, well, here we go again. Let's go. Track record is like, like, I can't deny the fact that the track record, when you look at your past, a lot of times we get so caught up in the moment when we're going through something. Just look at the past adversities that you have been through already. Mm -hmm. You probably got a pretty good track record. Mm -hmm. So don't forget about them. Just build on them. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I keep going. I, 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 my, my, my faith is fortified. My belief in, in myself to execute and just to, to, to persevere and just to just keep on keeping on it's so it's 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 kind of it's kind of this um irrational um uh, unshakable faith <laughs> that's kind of mm -hmm. it's just you just roll with it mm -hmm. I, I, i'm not really worried about it so um i don't really have an answer for how but that's what i've looked when i look reflect back i've looked it's a lot of it's a lot of small wins along the way a lot of w's that i've had through the adversities the challenges so i'm like well crap it's just another one so you know i made it through the last one I'm still here. Might as well keep going. And I don't mm -hmm. believe I, this is, I'm a firm believer. If we're still here, the job ain't done yet. If we're still on earth, then our time ain't came to an end yet. So the, the, the clock ain't hit zero. Why give up? The, the game taught me that. Mm -hmm. Like it ain't at zero yet. Keep playing. So this life game, well, we got another challenge. It ain't at zero yet. I'm still here. So keep going, Just keep pushing, mm -hmm. keep, keep trapping, keep fighting. And it just so happens that it tends to work out. So Landed on your feet. You know, it makes me think about like taking you back again to um, your like back in your college days. OK, so you, you had all this adversity and you you had a lot of great lessons along the way. You land at the University of Tennessee four year university. Go on if you want to. Right. But you've got your academics now. You've got the rigors of practice. You've got relationships you're building with your team, your coaches, um, campus life to navigate. Derek, like kind of think back from that perspective, what are some things that really helped you cope and be successful? What were some pitfalls that you had to navigate as well? And I, I'm gonna say this, I believe what I learned, if the why is big enough, the how to don't matter. 
Mm-hmm. So when I got here, the why of, of making it to the next level and changing my family's life was so big. The how I got it done didn't matter. So from a school perspective, I wasn't necessarily the best student. But what I realized earlier, one time in high school, when my grades were finna slip, mm-hmm. they were going to keep me from playing football. So mm-hmm. when I got here, the grades was essential for me to get to get the football thing done. So at that mm-hmm. point, I can't have you hindering what I need to get done so I can go play this to get to the next level. So grades, you're going to get took care of by default. Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to figure it out. Never was mm-hmm. I the best student. But I, I was aware that there are smarter people around you and you can always ask for help. And we got resources. So tap into them. So the greatest part, I was not going I can control that. That's a control. I, I was not going to let that hinder me um, from people skills and teammates. This is one of the biggest best in the skies. When I was young, we did a lot of moving. We moved mm-hmm. around a lot. So the first, I think, five years of school, I think I went to three or four elementary schools, three or four different schools. Well, wow. in that time frame, I learned how to make friends with really quick because I wasn't sure we was going to be there next year. Mm-hmm. So when you're young, it's making friends. Um, I concluded when you get older, they call it networking. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that tangible, transferable skill. When I got to college, you, you learn how to make friends really quick. And that part became pretty easy, which I was able to take that and use that around campus across the board. Um, when it came down to getting to Tennessee, the biggest thing I had was, look, I got to get the scholarship. It didn't go how I needed to go when I came out of high school. So whatever I got to do to get the scholarship, that's what I got to do. So grades, you got to work out. Um, I got to be able to impress coaches and be able to add enough value where they're going to say, okay, he's back. Here goes your scholarship. So that was really the the the, 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 the struggle and the, the journey because I'm like, okay, I'm here now. I came in with the number one recruiting class in the country. I got to show up. I'm nine months out for surgery. You're supposed to be off of, off of that surgery at that point in time. It's a year recovery. I was in nine months. Wow. So wow. it's like, all right, bro, you, you got to show up. You, you, I can't wait because these these loans that my mom helped got just to help me get here and some of this academic stuff that y'all was able to help set up, I, I need this thing to be fully covered football-wise. So that was the, the, the why. So at that point on, it was nothing else that was relevant. It was – you, you, you got to take care of business. So it was mm-hmm. day in, day out, show up so much and make it so they can't deny you. When they turn mm-hmm. on the film, they need, to, they need to see six every single time so they can't deny you. And the crazy thing about it was the first year I come out of camp, I go back to coach. I say, hey, coach, I made it through camp. Can I get my full ride scholarship? I've been there three. I've been there two months. They say no. I'm like, okay, maybe that was a little premature. So, <laughs> we go through the season. Ask. <laughs> <laughs> Had to ask. We go through the season. Cause I feel like I'm competing with some of the best guys out here. And I feel like I did better than some of them. So I, I asked the question, we go through the season, next camp come up 2006. I get bigger, I get stronger, I get faster, make it out of camp. I go back to coach. I said, hey, coach, can I get my full ride scholarship? They look at me and they're like, nope. So at this point I'm a little frustrated, but I'm like, all right, I ain't quite figured this thing out yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm like, I, I, I knew my alignments, my assignments, my read, my techniques. Mm-hmm. Okay. Season starts. During this season, a good friend of mine by the name of Inky Johnson gets hurt. We end up going to the hospital. And as we walk into the hospital room, we, we had the DBs. And we was um, about 13 deep at that time. I'm like the fourth guy behind Coach Slate. And as Coach Slate walks in, I'm behind him. And Coach asked Ink, he said, Ink, how you feeling? And Ink said, Coach, I'm at peace. Hmm. And when he said that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Cause I'm sitting here thinking his arm is paralyzed. He almost lost his life. He never gonna play this game again. He's at peace. I'm up here anxious, mad, mm-hmm. frustrated, eager. All these all emotions the in this full ride scholarship to mm-hmm. make sure this thing works out. And my arm still works. Mm-hmm. Like I can still play this game. So at that point I realized for the second time in the middle of my mess, I was missing my matches again. Oh wow! I, I was being selfish own personal, selfish ambitions, reasons, and goals. So at that moment there, it finally was declared, bro, you got to stop thinking about yourself. So the whole give your offer Tennessee, that's when it started making sense to me. And I I worked on how can I be the best teammate, um, the best student, the best son, the best brother, um, the the best I could be as a Tennessee Vol and give my all. And it was the biggest change I've ever seen in my life go. When I stopped focusing on my own personal selfish ambitions, reasons, and goals, 
everything else worked out in my favor. By the time we came out of camp, that season ends, we're going to camp the next year. I ended up getting mm-hmm. a full-ride scholarship at the University of Tennessee. I didn't even have to go ask for it. They brought it to me. Wow. But Derek, you know, when you say, I hear you when you say that, and man, what a great life lesson. But I just keep thinking in the back of my mind, you had this this additional pressure that some um, college students have, and it's that your extent, your family is looking to you to help them survive. And I don't mean that in any sort of disrespectful way or whatever. No, okay. It's, it's legit, you know, and, and, and I just think, how do you, how do you compartmentalize that kind of situation to where you can then give your all to Tennessee? Or is that just, it goes hand in hand? It, it, honestly, in my particular situation, it happened to work out hand in hand because the injury in high school. Mm. If it wasn't for that, I would have never got it. Because mm-hmm. guess what? Just like not only myself, but it's a lot of guys. When they come here, they're they're the meal ticket for the mm-hmm. family. They're, mm-hmm. they're that opportunity that's going to change that family's legacy. That's going to help grandma, help mom get out of that situation. So mm-hmm. the thought process isn't different. However, it was took away from me a little bit earlier. So mm-hmm. I had, I, and I got a little glimpse of being selfish and having an ego and 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 being a young male and everything going in your way. And then again, it took away from you. So the second time around, when it happened on a different scale, when I seen ink, it just put it in perspective for me. Yeah, and sure. I just was mm-hmm. aware enough to realize, bro, you being selfish again. Like you so focused on yourself, you're already here. And I seen the dynamics of, all right, first two years I asked them, they said, no, what can I do to add value? Mm-hmm. What am I not doing right that's going to make them say yes? Because at that point, I seen the college of business. I seen the business that was behind um, mm-hmm. athletics. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. when I realized you got to add enough value, not just on the field, but in the classroom, on the grades towards graduation. So now it makes you make them look good. Mm-hmm. That's very savvy. Graduation rates. Mm-hmm. Very savvy. It was a journey. To think about being a young, yeah, it is a journey. It's your brain's developing, you're learning, you're on a stage and everybody's looking at you and, you know, you become like a celebrity. You are a celebrity. You know, people are young, young boys and girls are, are looking up to you. And you also have that added pressure of how your behavior yeah. in public, you know, and how you're dealing with the transitions are being told, no, not yet. Like you got to check yourself, right? And you got to make sure that the attitude in public through the, all of those transitions really is a, is somewhat positive. I mean, I'm not talking about being fake or anything like that. Uh, you, you have to though. You it's, work. Yeah, no, you, you have to. We do, we do, we did media days and stuff like that. And it's, it's amazing. Um, and, and then the other part of the thing is you get a chance to be around guys from different backgrounds. So mm. you don't have those that got bigger egos and some that are more personable and some that don't want to do nothing. And some that just bad, bad, just, just, just got bad attitudes across the board. So you're going to get a chance to be around them. So it, you get a chance to hold each other accountable and you knowing that the coach would say this thing bigger than you. It's, it's about the T on the helmet. So you don't just embarrass your last name. You embarrass the T. So you get that conversation. So you have to adjust to realizing if you do something, it's going to be blown out of proportion drastically. So don't do, don't do nothing at all. And um, coach them made that pretty known. So it's, 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 it's a growing up a maturity because you're still a kid, but you got this, 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 this stage. So they do their best they can to show it to you. So for the most part, um, they keep you pretty busy where you can't help. You pretty much don't have time to do stupid stuff. Mm-hmm. But then again, it's always young male egos and athletes mm-hmm. and, and it always going to create an opportunity. You can find it if you want it. So, but it's I know. It. Stupid found me quite a few times in my youth. <laughs> like, I would look, <laughs> it's just part of it, you know. Thank God I learned from a lot of that stuff. That I know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, what was it like yeah. to transition to a new team with the University of Tennessee? Because you've got this high school situation where it sounds like, I mean, you're the big fish, big fish and small pond. Then you go to University of Tennessee. Um, and you're starting out with a freshman, so you are the little fish again in the really big pond. So what's that like? I mean, it's 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 cool, but it's one of those things that coming from Atlanta to getting to Arkansas, I realized I was around a lot of elite athletes. Then I get to mm-hmm. Arkansas, 
the scale changed and I automatically became that guy. So when I got to the University of Tennessee, I came in with the number one recruiting class in the country. So I already knew everybody I was coming in with was nice. So the chip on the shoulder is, bro, you got to show up. And then you get there and you realize it's guys that's going to be going to the league that's on the scene. They're grown men that just happen to be still in college. So the name of the game, you got to be humble enough to learn from those older guys, but you got to be cocky and arrogant enough to realize to feel like you're the best. And sometimes you 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 get a little, you know, you eat a little um, humble pie. And then sometimes um, you can navigate it. And if done right, it's a good balance. Mm-hmm. And at that point, mm-hmm. it's just it's just the coaching right system, right coaches. And if you show up enough, everything works out in your favor. But then again, you might get there. And what happened to me, I finally get a scholarship. And then that same year, who gets fired? Coach Former. Yeah. Just so you know, the, the business of college athletics, you're year to year with your scholarship. You sign for four years, but it's year to year. It can be revoked at the end of every year. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of pressure. Kevin comes in. I have to make sure I'm going to keep mine because mm-hmm. there's no guarantee. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the challenge and the grind of I don't work my butt off to get to this point. Now I got to keep it because there's a whole new regime coming in and they didn't care who was who. Yeah. Because their mm-hmm. goal is to put the best product on the field and they're not playing favorites because none of those guys they recruited. Mm-hmm. So the cool thing about it is everybody had to show back up. The cool thing that was in my advantage, I've been grinding to show up the whole time. Some guys had to turn it on. Mm-hmm. I had I, I never let up. So it worked out again, but that was a whole nother challenge because they could have easily been like, nah, yeah, you don't fit our system. You got to go. Yes, and a whole nother transition. A whole, whole nother, nother transition. transition. Whole coaching staff, whole administration, everything gone. New, all new people. Mm-hmm. You got to prove your worth all over again. How do so you, you just kept pressure? your foot on the pedal. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's good. That's just a lot of pressure. And as a kid, I mean, you think about it. These are college kids. They're not, you say grown men. And some of them are because you've got older kids and stuff. But I yeah, mean, just when you're 18, 19 years old, like, how do you, how do you handle that? Spotlight I, on SEC football is insane. I, so it's one of those things you kind of know what you sign up for. So, for example, I, like, I'm going to get back to the pressure because it's there, but it's not. But it is. <laughs> you don't really know what you sign up for. You see it. You come on a visit. I didn't necessarily visit until the spring game. So I didn't see what it was like on the game day. People camping out two days before a game mm-hmm. and yes. everybody on campus in the ball walk. So when I saw that, I'm like, these people crazy. <laughs> so yeah. we go visit Children's Hospital and we're in there. We in, we're in Children's Hospital and we went to the cancer unit. People hadn't missed a game in 30 years. And they're dying of cancer, terminal cancer, and they're crying because we're there. I'm like, I didn't understand that you no. you got cancer. I should be crying for you. You're crying because we're here and you ain't missed a game in 30 years. And all of a sudden, it, it, I didn't understand the value add and the, the life that, that Orange added to people. So that part was, was kind of crazy. So seeing that, that was the, I guess, they gave you the bigger picture, man. This thing really gives hope to a lot of people. No. Um so indirectly, it kind of is a pressure, but but as a athlete and knowing that you you were looking at as the meal ticket and you had this bigger goal, the goal mm-hmm. is to go anyway. So you don't have to think about the added pressure because you already got your own that's self-imposed anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And as long as you get a chance to show up and perform and you're doing what you're going to do, everything else just kind of uh, it, it comes with it. But mm-hmm. you never decompartmentalize me. I got the pressure of. Of the family, the family pressure and making it to the league pressure is going to probably be those main two pressures. Then you probably got, I got to make sure I'm taking care of business in, in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then you yeah. probably, then you probably got if you don't know how to um, handle um, females, you're going to have another pressure. Um, <laughs> so all the other mm-hmm. stuff, the performance. So it, it's one of those things where it can happen, but luckily, if done right, you get here earlier time. You get here in the summertime. You get a chance to get adapted to the classes. And then they're doing it early enrollment so you get to come a whole semester early so you get a chance to figure out the lay of the land take a little bit less class lighter load pick your majors figure out okay i learned, i realized i thought i was good at math until i got to college um then i had stats and then i realized i need no math so i changed my major <laughs> up to legal studies which was all paper because they they great you can they can't can't give me a zero on my thoughts so you play the game so i removed pressure from the classroom side and then navigated the performance to get the scholarship to the change of family's life to the to, to see can you make it to the league but it's it's all levels to it but really i don't think you um you don't decompartmentalize because you realize hey you're here on the biggest stage and you come to the sec because you know you're gonna have the biggest stage and 
you believe it or not, some people handle it well, some don't. And you see mm-hmm. transfers, you see people that academically get dismissed. You see guys that transfer or the guys that quit. I mean, you get guys that can't pass drug tests. Mm-hmm. Coping happens a lot of different ways. Um, but I was fortunate enough the 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 um with stuff not working out in my past, the coping was bro, you gotta execute and 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 get this done. So the go the why was so big, it kept me on track. That was that was probably the biggest blessing in disguise, honestly. What was your like coping, your self care? How did you take care of yourself during that time? So a, a, a lot of the times, um, it was it was it was learning. So it was a period of time. So is this kind of funny? Um, so freshman year, we had a women's studies class or something, and you know we we're in class we're wearing our sweats. Come to find out, the lady did not like males, let alone athletes. So mm-hmm. I had. Three papers, all done with help from the Thornton Center, the academic mm-hmm. place that helps us. And all three papers were magically lost when it was time to get graded. So we got them printed, got them turned back in. At that moment there, I realized it didn't give me an advantage to be an athlete. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it gave me a disadvantage. So mm-hmm. at that point, I stopped wearing all football-related clothes to classes, and I started wearing dress clothes like suits. Wow. Really? Yes. So literally, if you talk to any of my people that was in school with me from 05 to 09, they were like, he always wore suits to class and they were trying to figure out why. So it was this whole thing. How you're perceived is how you're received. So I just wanted to change the whole dynamic. So my one of the co- things I cope with, I said, I know my family's background. No one had been to college and got a, a degree. And then this whole thing of finances, I do nothing about that. So I would literally have meetings with financial advisors. I said, if I go to the league, I want to, re- I want to represent myself. And I want to be able to take care of my finances. So coping was learning for me. Yeah. I wanted to learn. I wanted to realize all those things that, but the, the blind spots was that and all those probably pain points of financial literacy and um, mm-hmm. all right, if I make this thing, how do I not get took advantage of? I pretty much mm-hmm. wanted to learn. Um, and then music for a period of time, it was the fun that we would do. In the summertime, there was a studio in the library. It's still there, I believe. And we would just go up there and make music um, and talk about some of the daily stuff. So those were probably my main two. And then the weight room, I, I, I found, I get a lot of peace about working out now. It's kind of, it's crazy because I didn't like to do it, but I did it so much it became normal. And um, that was my quiet time. So personal development, um, at that point, I only was sitting with all these different financial advisors. I might've met like a hundred of them. Um, so I learned to see who was real, who was going to make up BS. And just, I just sat with them all. Um, and then from that point, working out and, and, and music now it done transition so more to reading but that was it just figuring out what were the areas i was weak at and how i can develop those scripts that was a lot of the coping that i did because it kept mm-hmm. me moving forward i'm on mm-hmm. this really pursuit of getting better that form forward momentum yep. hey you hit on something that is so key right now that financial literacy piece mm-hmm. is huge and let me just tell you derek we would do this every year i would we'd have a a part of our curriculum or a time in the school year where we would talk about people who were influential, influential heroes, why they were heroes. And, you know, most of the time the boys would name an athlete. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so we would go down that and we were, why is this person an influential person? You know, blah, 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 blah. And they all had their little, little reasons that were big to them and that sort of thing. And then we would, you know, kind of segue that into why academics are important. And they'd be like, but no, I don't, I don't need to do math. I'm going to play ball. I don't need to learn how to write. I'm going to play ball. I, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't need this stuff. And as an educator, you were trying to find people in the spotlight that um, were writing things that were great. So you could show them like, look, buddy, you know, you can't put everything on outside of your control. Like you you need to understand when you get older that you're going to have to have some control over your finances because this person was an NFL player, lost everything to some bad advice for finances. Um, Or they signed a contract where basically they signed everything away that was going to be good because, you know, you have to boil it down to where they can understand it. They signed everything away because they didn't really understand how to, you know, carefully read a contract and they didn't have trusted people around 
around them to help them make those decisions. So yes, you need to have, you need to understand from a young age, the importance of the academic piece so that you can go on. And, you know, now it's the financial literacy piece for athletes and having a legacy for themselves. Um, you know, realizing that unfortunately, you know, 1% makes it to the NFL or whatever. That's the last stat, stat I heard. But you have hundreds of thousands of kids who that's, they really think that, that that's their, and it's great to have goals, but they think I'm going to make millions of dollars. Money's not going to be an issue. I'm going to be able to take care of my friends, my family, whatever. And the reality is, you know, it doesn't happen for most of them. Right. So they have to understand that academic piece is really important. So you just like what happened to you, right? You went down that path. It was your passion. You understand that you, you understood that academics needed to be in that fold so that you could keep your scholarship and stay on the field. But look how it benefited you outside of sports, of actively playing. You're an author. You're a motivational speaker. You have to write things. You tweet out all the time. Wonderful, wonderful, inspirational things. Um, you can't do that if you're uneducated. You're, you're it's right. not going to be as powerful. You're, you're right. So it, it was one of the biggest things seeing where we grew up. I, I the, the self care came in. I was trying to learn so I didn't get got. Like I was trying mm. to learn so that I wouldn't end up that statistic or learn so I could put myself and make sure we was in a better spot. So the self-care didn't, it wasn't like other things. It was literally like education. Cause I'm like, where the background was like, nobody had it or nobody knew how to get it. And it was like, they was hiding all this good information. And when I got to Tennessee, I got exposed to a different world. We went to these donors homes. I'm like, oh, you got seven cars. Why you got so many cars? It, it was, it, 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 it was the, the exposure. Oh, that's a boat. Oh, wow. I, I'm mm -hmm. not getting that water, but that's that's a nice boat. Like <laughs> water. all these things, like we we didn't necessarily get vacation. I was, I had away football games that was vacation. Now all of a sudden we going to away games, and then we go to bowl game. All of a sudden we open up in in UCLA and on planes. We bringing in New Year's on bowl games. I'm like, what? Like this? Oh, this can be normal. You just got to be able to do it and understand how economics work, and and actually understand how to be. It, it was exposure. Um, so. My coping looked a little different, like because I've probably gone through a lot of stuff. I just didn't know what to call it, and I didn't understand those things that were helping me get through it. Now, when I reflect mm -hmm. back on it, it was educating me. I wanted to learn because I'm like, okay, if I ever make it, I don't want to get got. I want to get dealt, got over on. I want to make sure I can show this because, and then I wanted to remove excuses for my the people that was gonna come behind me because mm -hmm. everybody coming from the same block: sister, nephew, cousins, brother. Mm -hmm. If I do it and I remove the excuses, you can't say you can't say that I had an upper leg. You you can't say mm -hmm. that I had an unfair advantage. We we mm -hmm. came from the same mama. We we came from the same hood. We're on the same corner. So mm -hmm. what's your excuse? So mm -hmm. it, it was a lot of those things that was there. I guess I probably that helped me either cope or help me get over. I, I have no clue, but it, it, it was the, I would say that was probably be the coping understanding what. Uh, what self care is and, and, and what that looks like, and I know it's different ways. That was probably my method, which was probably unorthodox to some degree. But um, in the midst of all the the chaos, it was getting better. That was allowing me to endure and persevere and push forward and, and not, I guess, break. Because you, I mean, you can go either way. It's true. It's a big transition. I keep from thinking about football to what you do now. It is, but it, it, it is, but the, the, the purposeful part is not, um, was I was able to find out. Uh, so this is what I've concluded. I was able to get in alignment with my true assignment. Mm. When I played football, initially before my death as an athlete, my high school, I thought I thought I was an athlete. Then I get to college and I realized I was more than an athlete. And then all of a sudden it became a thing where they said, well, as I started taking back the layers, I was the guy that broke the huddles, that set the chance, that they mm -hmm. got the team excited. So in reality, you could say I was a, a motivational speaker disguised as a football player back then. Mm -hmm. Like, wow. Who, who really know? Now, I was terrible at writing. I don't know this whole writing, authoring three books. That's a whole different thing. But <laughs> um, so it's layers. You just got to remove the, the labels. And once I removed the labels, um, 
All of a sudden you write some books. All of a sudden you're an entrepreneur. All of a sudden you're, you're, you're an author. All of a sudden you're speaking. I realized we put titles on ourselves, that whole athlete title. And until you die to that identity as an athlete, the, the transition is a struggle. But now mm-hmm. I just have real, a, a new line, uh, 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 truly in alignment with my assignment and my purpose as an athlete. Um, that was just one of the steps. That was one of the, the steps. That, that vehicle got me so far. And then it was time for me to, to, to just get into another vehicle to get me the rest of the way. It wasn't going to get me to the finish line like I thought it was. So um, I get a chance to impact, inspire, and empower people, which I was doing that, breaking a chance in the huddles. I get a chance to lead. I get a chance to build relationships. I get a chance to hold people accountable, which I was doing it with my teammates. I get a, I get a chance to to do a lot of those things. It just looks different because it's not in a helmet and shoulder pads and not much running or jumping or tackling. Um, so yeah, it's a whole lot safer. <laughs> whole lot safer. Makes me think too, Derek. Um, all those life experiences, having a strong woman, your mom in your life who laid a foundation of, it sounds like faith and resiliency, grit, love, um, laid that down for you. You picked it up. And then as a young man, you started to embody those values and apply them um, in adverse situations. And then you were able to be on the big stage and maybe not so humble at first, but then you, you found it. It found you. Humility found you. And maybe that's have an inky in your life or the injuries, or maybe it's a combination of everything. But through all of those transitions, you're one of the, I've known you for a little while now. You're one of the most positive people I know. It's genuine as the day is long. Um, And I think that's just a part of who you are. What about kiddos who, that you, you saw growing up, Derek, that don't have that foundation, are scared of transition, scared of the unknown, Fear rules because fear's taught. How do those kids, how do those kids break out? How do they get to the next transition? Mm, that's that's a real one, and I appreciate those words, Candy. And um, I, I'll say this: when the whole thing of of fear, um, I, I I I I think it's it's definitely a thing. But what I've concluded over my time, it was fake evidence appearing real and most of the time there's fear and uncertainty Mm -hmm. so when I started learning how to just plan what I want for my life and then take those actions that was going to get me that it created this certainty that I can make it happen and it removed Mm -hmm. the fear Um, so for those that are in those challenging situations or those struggles um, I would just advise them to Fear is fake evidence appearing real, and, and, and it's normally caused for uncertainty, not knowing the unknown. So if you're mm-hmm. able to make a game plan for what you want, you can create the known so you'll know what's on the back end of what you want. And then from that point, you make sure everything that you're doing is moving you in that same direction. And along the way, you got to realize you're going to have some ups, some downs, some challenges, some adversities. You're going to have some mountaintops, some peaks, some valleys. Um, but I learned from Coach Foreman. Things are never as bad as they say they are. They're never as good as they say they are. They're always right in the middle. So you just got to stay right in the middle and keep going because life is going to happen. And Mm -hmm. the journey is not going to be easy. Um, You just got to learn how to handle hard better. And Mm -hmm. a lot of the time through the process, a a, a mentor of mine that I learned from audiobooks when I was learning just personal development, Jim Rome, he says, don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. So when I wanted more playing time, I wanted my scholarship. Don't wish it was easier. Wish it was better. I had to be better at making them want to give me a scholarship. I had to be better at them making me want to play. I had to be better at getting the grades I need to. So I know it was going to make sure I can continue to play. I had to be better at people skills. I had to be better. Like, don't wish it was easier. Wish it was better. So I just started taking this ridiculous amount of personal um, ownership Mm -hmm. and accountability for my own life. And not blaming people because mm-hmm. life gonna happen to everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Same, the same, the, I, I've heard this say a long time ago that it's, it's not the blowing of the wind, it's the setting of the sail. The wind gonna blow, but depending on how your sail is set, that's gonna determine which way you go. 
So life gonna happen to everybody. Somebody gonna have a death in the family. Somebody gonna have a sickness. Somebody gonna have an unforeseen accident. Somebody gonna have some financial struggles. It's gonna probably happen to us all, but it's a setting of the cell. So one of the things that I learned that the game taught me was minimize the variables. There's gonna be variables every single day. What can you do to the best of your abilities to minimize them so everything works out in your favor? And the second piece of that is controlling the controllables. You can control the things you can control. Mm-hmm. Everything else you can't control, don't worry about it. Yeah. And then the last piece was take massive action. I've been applying those since since school, since high school, and it just so happened to work out. I was able to put words to it in, in college. And now that philosophy um, it, it's embodied in me by default because I seen when I was able to minimize the variables, control the controllables, and take massive action, the track record looks really well on the back end. In the midst mm-hmm. of the storm, in the midst of the adversity, in the midst of the challenges, the track record looked really, really well. And without me blaming people, because a lot of the times if, if we play victim long enough, you're going to get victim results. Um, That's true. That's true. Tell that, me again, Derek. Tell us again. You said it very quickly. Break down fear again. What was that? Fake evidence appearing real. Fake evidence appearing real. My God, that should be a T-shirt. It's beautiful. That's it. So wow, I feel like I so many hurt. things that he said today should be a T-shirt. You were just like the inspirational <laughs> quote king. <laughs> we're gonna so open up inspired. a T-shirt shop on Gay Street. I'm ready to tackle <gasps> the rest of my day today because of you. I know. <laughs> Come on, Kristen. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> wow, it's good stuff, Derek. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate. It. Should we should we move into the lightning round? Oh, Kristen? I'm ready. I'm ready, ready for the lightning Are you round. Ready? Are you ready, Derek? Let's do it. Born ready. I, I right. feel like we should have some sort of like music on in the background like or something for the lightning more? round. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I'm gonna a theme song for the lightning round. Maybe Brick can do something like that. That would be really ready, fun. Right? <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> Um, I've got my set up, my questions on this side, Derek, and they're not going to see Kristen and I for this part. So I'm sorry. I'm probably not going to be looking at you. I'm going to, I want to be able to read this so you can really hear it. Cause again, they're not going to hear me. They're only going to hear, or Kristen, they're only going to hear what you're saying. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. We got to, we got to keep it under a minute. Cause I think that's the YouTube shorts like limit. So. Okay. Perfect. For each question. Yeah. I'll go first. Ready? All right. What's one piece of advice you have for any high school or college student that's going through a big life change? As you're going through your change in the middle of your mess, don't miss the message. Realize everything that you're growing through is preparing you for where you're going to. So don't wish it was easier, wish you were better, and you got to learn how to handle hard better. So one of the biggest things you can do is accept nothing, defy everything and attack life and have this relentless pursuit of continuing improvement. That's awesome. Nailed it. Um, with the rest of the questions, um, if for some reason your response doesn't reference what the question was, it might help to restate the question in the response, not verbatim, but you did great on that one. Okay, here we go. Sometimes things don't work out the way you think they will. How do you feel about having a backup plan? It is it is it important and can it alleviate stress? If things don't work out the way you expect they will, it's always good to have options because things must most likely not go exactly how you expect them to go. So the name of the game is having options and don't view it as a backup plan because when you view it as a backup plan, you think if this doesn't work, then I, I just have no choice but to do this. But you give yourself options. I can do this, 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 or this and still get that same result. Um, that's the name of the game because there are different roads travel to get to the end result. There are different roads travel to get to the end destination. So you don't have to think that the one road that you are looking to go, if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, you can't still get to the end destination. Shoot, man. <laughs> that's good. That's really good advice. I love that. I always think in terms of backup plans. I, I don't like, I've never thought about it like that. Like, I've just thought like, if this doesn't work out, out <laughs> this. like if I don't do this, then I can do this. But I've always thought about it as a backup plan, but you're right. Like there's just different roads to get to the same end des- destination. Awesome. GPS time it. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I love the way you look at the world. <laughs> I love it. You do. All right. What did you learn from your failures or mistakes that have stayed with you? Ooh. 
what did you learn from your failures or mistakes that stayed with you? For one, if you don't quit, it ain't over. Um, failures are the best learning and teachable moments because they equip you and make you better for the next lesson, the next opportunity that come your way. And expect the unexpected, hope for the best, um, prepare for the worst, and accept nothing and defy everything. Attack life. Attack life. I like that. Don't be a passive bystander. Okay. I love this question. Derek, how do you flex your mental fitness to stay positive and motivated? So this one is pretty cool. Um, I got a, I got a, a routine that um, it's my, it's my, it's my self care um, that keeps me positive. So first thing, wake up in the morning, thank God for the day, read the devotional, add value to the world, run to the gym and on that run, get a PD session in quick little audio, two to three minutes, um, get that lift in. And from that point moving forward, I'm ready to attack the day. So the biggest flex is knowing how to control your mental and get your mind right. Um, so you're grinding right. Cause if your mind ain't right, you're grinding right. So um, you got to be able to control you first. If you can't help yourself, you can't help others. It's another good t-shirt. Mind ain't right, grind ain't right. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. This next one is, or the last one, is uh, going to reference COVID a little bit. So what's one impact that you've seen uh, that COVID has had on teens trying to navigate their transitions? The biggest impact I've seen with COVID in teens is the ability to pivot or the lack there of the pivot. Because from an athletic perspective, I've seen athletes that were fin to graduate or finish their eligibility, get another year. Then I seen athletes that were coming into college realizing, hey, now these people that are there got an extra year, so that's less scholarships for me. Then I seen athletes that might have been in a situation and realized they wanted to go somewhere else. And then I just seen students or in, 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 in young young kids as a whole um, have to go from being social to antisocial and learning how to learn online and it's adaptive way of, 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 of learning. So the biggest thing is you, you never know what life going to give you. You just got to be prepared to handle it um, and, and be resilient and be able to just accept what comes your way and take and make the most of it um, and maximize the opportunity and then be able to add that to your toolbox. So when things do go back to what you thought they were going to be, um, you're more equipped, you're more prepared and you're ahead of the game versus feeling like you can't readjust or you don't like a certain setting or things didn't go in your favor because at the end of the day, the same wind blew us on us all in COVID. Um, some of us just had a better setting of a sale. So we went a different direction and we were able to pivot and, and make it better, make the most of that situation. Wow. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek Furlow Jr. Thank you so much for joining us today on Stanford Kinds Talks. We just really appreciate your time. I feel like I've learned so much. I feel like ready to go out and like charge the day. Mm -hmm. Like I'm stoked. I'm just fired up. Um, a lot of words of wisdom for such a young man, honestly. Um, we just really appreciate you. And uh, we'd love to have you back on in some other time. Look, I appreciate y'all time, the energy, the opportunity. Um, the, the the words of kindness and, and what y'all doing with Stanford County. I'm definitely um, humbled and blessed and grateful to be a part of it and would love to be on it anytime. Thank y'all for, for having me.